Hi, good day everyone. We're going to get started. My name is Jillian Kaloff and I'm the Vice President of Operations at Climate Action Reserve. I'd like to welcome you all to our Climate Week event, a force to reckon with, women in the climate change workforce. Prioritizing and investing in diversity, equity, and inclusion is something I am incredibly passionate about. Diversity, including gender diversity, is crucial, not only in terms of social justice, but also in terms of bringing creativity, innovation, and effectiveness to the table to solve the climate crisis. I am proud to work at an organization that recognizes how important this is. And so I feel incredibly honored to welcome you all to this important and inspiring panel. I'm certain that the experiences and the stories that will be shared by these leading women will be a highlight and an inspirational tone for Climate Week as the events get underway today. Thank you all again for joining us. We are incredibly fortunate to have with us here today our moderator, Tavia Barnes, former executive director of the California Infrastructure and Economic Development Bank, Mary Nichols, Chair of the California Air Resources Board, Nancy Sutley, Senior Assistant General Manager and Chief Sustainability Officer at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, and Marilyn Waite, Program Officer for the Environment at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. And so without further delay, I would like to turn it over to our moderator, Tavia Barnes. Uh, thank you, Jillian, and welcome everyone to, to our uh, Force to Reckon with Women in the Climate Change Workforce uh, webinar today. Before we begin our discussion with our three distinguished environmental leaders, each a force to reckon with in the climate change workforce in their own right, we wish to send our condolences to the family, friends, and acolytes around the world of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The notorious RBG was indeed a force to reckon with when it came to women's rights as human rights and protecting everyone's right to equal protection under the law. For Justice Ginsburg's guidance towards a true democracy, we will be forever grateful. Our first panelist is Mary Nichols. Mary has served on the California Air Resources Board under three governors, and as California Secretary for Natural Resources. When not working for the state of California, Mary was a senior staff attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council. She's been the assistant administrator for the US EPA's Office of Air and Radiation during President Clinton's administration. And she headed the Institute of Environment and Sustainability at UCLA. Mary Nichols has played a key role in California and the nation's progress towards a healthy environment. So Mary, welcome. Thank you for giving us your time this morning. Why have you made the environment your unwavering career path? I can't say that I grew up knowing that I was going to be an environmentalist because in all honesty, there was no such field uh, when I was coming up uh, through high school, college, even in law school, the field of environmental law did not exist. It was a cutting edge thing to be involved with when I was in law school. And I was friends with a group of guys, and they were all guys who started the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, I wasn't part of their club. Um, I became an environmentalist through a somewhat backdoor way. Uh, I wanted to work in the public interest field. I was graduating from law school in 1971, which is really the 60s, and uh, had worked in the civil rights movement in the 60s. And uh, I wanted to do something that involved social change. That was my goal. I did not want to go work in the corporate law sector. And uh, so I went out looking in a new city because I moved to Los Angeles at, right after graduating from law school and found that what was happening, the only thing that was really going on was uh, this new public interest law movement. And it was focused primarily on the environment. The first case that I was ever involved with was a, an effort in which the clients were both the NAACP 
and the Sierra Club joined together with a couple of small cities who were fighting a freeway, uh, the Century Freeway. Eventually that freeway was built, but after our efforts, it was turned into a freeway with a median that had a transit line down the middle of it, and the state had to uh, provide replacement housing for all the people along the way, working class people mostly, many of them people of color who were dislocated by the freeway. That was actually the beginning of the environmental law movement in Los Angeles. So uh, I, I say that uh, because it's a great opportunity to remind ourselves that the, the linkages between environment and environmental justice are, are not new, but they are being rediscovered and hopefully advanced again. Thank you, uh, Mary, for that. Our next panelist is Nancy Sutley. Nancy is the Senior Assistant General Manager of external and regulatory affairs of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. In this role, Nancy had oversight over w, um, DWP's uh, customer service operations, energy efficiency and water conservation programs, environmental regulation, public affairs, and the legislative teams. Prior to joining LADWP, Nancy served as chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, she was the deputy mayor for the energy and environment for the city of Los Angeles. She was a board member of the Metropolitan Water District, a member of the California State Water Resources Control Board, the energy advisor for California, the deputy secretary for policy and intergovernmental relations at the California EPA, and the senior policy advisor for the US EPA also during President Clinton's administration. Nancy, what inspired you to pursue such an audacious career protecting the environment? Well, thanks, and uh, thanks uh, for having me here. Um, well, I, I guess I go back to uh, when I was a child. I grew up in New York City. Um, we lived uh, right by um, the, East, uh, the Long Island Sound and the, and the uh, Little Neck Bay. And at the time, um, the water was very polluted because New York was basically dumping raw sewage uh, into into the East River, into Long Island Sound. And I remember my mother would tell us, you know, we, we could go down to the shoreline, but we couldn't go in the water because we, we'd get sick. Um, and then if we fell in, she'd have to wash us off with kerosene. I don't know where she got that from, but... Um, so, you know, I think as a, from the time that I was young, I, I recognized we had work to do. Um, and so I got my master's in, in public policy um, at the Kennedy School uh, and joined many of my classmates in Washington, D.C. early in my career, uh, working on energy and environmental policy, which I studied. Um, and so uh, I found that the environment was a, was both um, an important public policy problem to address and one that I think that you could really see because the groundwork had been laid um, if if you applied the public policies to, to the environment, you would see the changes um, and the improvements in the environment. Um, I also uh, had some important um, mentors uh, in my career, including Mary Nichols, who we started at, at US EPA in the Clinton administration, I think on either the same day or roughly the same day. Um, and um, our, our boss at the time, Carol Browner, who was the administrator of EPA. And it was a, um, it was a very uh, busy time for EPA, uh, particularly in the air quality arena, dealing with um, amendments to the Clean Air Act that really um, took that um, law to sort of a new level. Um, so over that time, um, both at EPA and then working for the state of California, really uh, working with an incredible group of people to uh, show how you could take the, the, the grassroots community level efforts um, and, the, and the public policies and really make change positively for the environment. So 
uh, you know, I, I've followed that career ever since, um, worked with amazing people, um, and, um, and I'm happy to um, continue that here in Los Angeles. No, it, it is amazing how there is a cross of crossover between the environment and the community, and it's the community issues that come up first and foremost, and and that lead to the the policy decisions to address the issues that are so drastically affecting uh, the community. So thank you, uh, Nancy. Uh, I am uh, happy to introduce now Marilyn Wade. She's a program officer in environment at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Marilyn manages the foundation's grant making on climate and clean energy finance with the ambitious goal of addressing climate change by accelerating the transition to a climate friendly economy. Marilyn has worked across four continents in venture investments, startups, and low carbon energy. She has led several operational and research and development projects at Areva in France, including performing technical and economic studies in the energy water nexus and the nuclear energy cycle. Um, Marilyn is the author of Sustainability at Work, and she lectures on sustainable business at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. So Marilyn, welcome. Uh, I see that your um, your career uh, has uh, brought you to the Hewlett Foundation. Why did you accept the climate and clean energy finance role at Hewlett? Thanks, Tivia, and it's so nice to be among the fellow panelists today uh, during Climate Week. Um, I think we're all in California, and I have uh, some an image of a, a fire. Um, I wish the fires were only in our fireplaces, but they are they are not. And so I'm very happy to be here at this time and talk about um, climate finance and our journeys. Um, so I, I was actually trained as an environmental engineer and I was working in nuclear energy and other uh, low carbon energy resources, um, offshore wind, solar, and I was in corporate research and development and I found finance to be a barrier. And so I kind of shifted focus from there. Financial capital is the engine for the green economy transition. And I wanted to make an impact on the trajectory of our whole financial ecosystem, not just one asset class um, and multiple markets, not just one. Um, so today the work spans China, the European Union and the United States, including California. Um, and it spans multiple financial asset classes. So venture capital, you know, our high risk sources to do the things we need to have done like seasonal storage, um, asset management and bank lending and credit. Um, and through these markets and pools of capital, we can actually shift the trillions and shift them systemically. Thank you. So thank you, Marilyn, Nancy, um, Mary, for sharing your passion for protecting the environment and how the community affects uh, your work. Uh, now we wish to understand why you are each, I have a sense of why you're each a force to be reckoned with uh, as a leader. Could you please, Mary, start by describing how you have furthered your career goals to protect the environment? Well, um, as you mentioned when you introduced me, I am the chair of the California Air Resources Board, and CARB is where I began my career in public service, and it's where I returned uh, now almost 15 years ago uh, when I was looking to come back to California and to make the biggest possible difference that I could make uh, on the quality of the environment. So um, for me, it's been a process of um, learning both my field, which is air pollution, and how connected it is in so many really interesting and important ways to uh, science, technology, health, uh, and politics. Uh, all of those things are uh, very much uh, a part of the problem and uh, part of the solution. Uh, and over time, by working in several different locations, both in the uh, not-for-profit not world, uh, 
as a volunteer on a commission that uh, Nancy now uh, works for in the city of Los Angeles, the uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, which is the largest municipally owned utility in the United States and one that is trying very hard to transition away from fossil fuels, but is still a very big um, emitter. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to hone my skills in a variety of different um, locations. But for me, uh, the California Air Resources Board is the place where I have the most ability to uh, be a force uh, to reckon with uh, because as a state agency, uh, an appointee of the governor with a, with a uh, staff of over a thousand people, many of them um, highly trained and qualified scientists, engineers, and lawyers. Uh, I get to help uh, set their goals and uh, give them leadership uh, in the political arena to be their champion uh, in, in public, uh, as well as uh, work with them uh, internally on crafting a, a, a regulatory program. And um, there's, real power in that to do good and uh, I think that's that's where I wanted to be so I'm very happy that at this stage of my career I've been able to uh, to get to the point where we are we at the California Resources Board or CARB as it's called are in fact look to uh, not only within California or the country but truly around the world uh, as a leader in having figured out how to address the problem of smog, which is only getting worse in many parts of the developing world, and to um, work uh, as we still must in California to try to uh, overcome some of the last obstacles to really uh, getting healthy air for all our people. Yeah, yeah, Mary, it's, it's really, um... Uh, heartening to hear and of course we know about a uh, car and the work that you do and the fact that you do have professionals and scientists and engineers and lawyers and and all of this expertise coming together um, to come up with policies that are, are well founded um, okay. and moving us forward. Uh, Nancy, uh, could you share with us the successes that continue to inspire you to protect the environment? Um, sure, thanks. And, you know, uh, thank you, Mary, for mentioning uh, LADWP. You know, it, it, is, it is kind of, um, it's, it's exciting time to be doing this work uh, because I think uh, we're really now focused on, on solutions and not necessarily on arguing, at least in California, on arguing about what the problem is. And so, uh, you know, LADWP, uh, both the nation's largest municipal utility and also the one, one part of uh, LA city government that every Angelino deals with, um, when you do things right, you can see the impact on the community. When you do things, when you do things not so right, you can also see those impacts. So, you know, I think that um, really the, the, the leadership of the city and the state of California um, pushing, uh, pushing us to do more to address both these uh, longstanding environmental issues and climate change is really making this a, a fascinating time to be uh, in, in the energy business. But I also wanted to sort of go back to, as I think over the length of my career, um, when I started working at EPA with Mary and, and others, um, you know, the environment was one of those things that was looked at as, a, you know, it's EPA's problem, it's EPA's issue, you know, it's all about those, you know, those environmental statutes. Um, and then, you know, I left EPA and went to the state of California and city of Los Angeles and, and then went back into the federal government in, in 2009. And what was um, refreshing to see had really changed over those intervening years at the federal level was something that had seen both at the state and local level and really from coming up from the community was that the environment isn't just about one environmental regulation, even really good regulations. It really has to be, uh, as they, they say in the federal government, a whole of government approach or a whole of society approach and particularly around climate change. Um, and you can't separate out 
um, sort of the greenhouse gas emissions from air pollution or from the impact um, that climate change is having in California right now, as you see with fires and, and uh, drought cycles and sea level rise and all of those um, effects that, that have been predicted uh, to result from climate change. So um, I think that, uh, so when I went back into the federal government, um, every agency thought that they had a stake in addressing climate change. They, they all thought that they had a role to play in, in uh, pushing forward on sustainability initiatives. And I think the more that that's embraced, um, whether it's in government, um, in, in the economy uh, at large, um, as people live their own lives, I think we, we, will, we will continue to make progress towards addressing um, these very um, important and urgent issues around um, environment and climate change. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, uh, California definitely has been a leader, um, not only in the United States, but th throughout the world in uh, the work in LA, uh, the work in the, our Southern California has, has been um, very important to that effort. Uh, Marilyn, um, uh, what are you most proud of in your work at the Hewlett Foundation? So because we're in Climate Week 2020, and this is the first virtual convening, um, it's a time of announcements. And I just wanted to highlight one particular initiative that I'm proud of and has reached a milestone um, for this year's Climate Week. And that is PCAF, uh, the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials. So, we were the primary backers of this initiative um, for almost two years now. And it is an initiative that is industry-led, banks and asset managers coming together and measuring, disclosing, and reducing the carbon emissions of their core business, which is to lend and invest. So asset class by asset class, they are measuring the tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in absolute emission terms and they are reporting that and they are reducing that. Um, and so this is systemically big. Uh, when we had first invested in PCAF, there were about 150 billion US dollars worth of capital doing this. And now there's over 12 trillion with major annou announcements um, just as recently as last week um, from large banks like NatWest Group and Lloyds Bank in the UK to some of the biggest institutions in the United States like Bank of America, uh, Citigroup and Morgan Stanley. And I'm particularly proud that this is this has been led by the sustainability focused banks. So this all started in the Netherlands with a group of Dutch asset owners and managers and banks. And when it was brought to the United States, it was really the credit unions and the regional community banks and the national sustainable banks like Amalgamated Bank that really took the effort and said, we need to lean in on this. It's these institutions that have ESG or environmental, social, and governance factors embedded in their DNA. And they really led the charge to, uh, to bring along the laggard banks um, and other asset managers. And so I'm really proud that it's reached this milestone and I'm happy to have it um, grow and also see it mandated by our regulatory authorities, really making this status quo for uh, bank regulations and asset management regulations to have this measurement and disclosure and goals to reduce to be a, you know status quo so that we can actually transition the economy as I mentioned before this is the engine of how we have this transition. Thank you Meryl. Uh, you know I agree with you you have to follow the money when the money starts to uh, be used for good in the community it, it really makes a difference and I was formerly uh, heading up uh, California infrastructure and economic development thing. and we found also that the um, the community banks, the community credit unions, uh, often again, as you all have mentioned uh, the, today, it, it's the community that first identifies these issues that are affecting the the environment. That is, uh, um, so it's it's not. Uh, too surprising that the community banks um, and the, at that financing level uh, would be involved initially. But it's wonderful and very heartwarming to hear that the larger multinational 
institutions have um, are coming to see the importance of the environment and their role to play in making sure that the funds are available uh, to make it happen. And as you've all said today, as science informs us all, human behavior is the most dominant cause of observed climate change over the last hundred years. In more recent years, also, as you've mentioned, the devastating consequences of climate change, including the dangerously rising sea levels, the severe storms and droughts, uh, particularly in California, that intensify the magnitude and frequency of the raging wildfires that are expanding throughout the Western states, and the resulting higher concentration of ash in the air and the water and, uh, and the land. Uh, we're now at a point where the simple act of breathing outside in certain parts of the US during the last six months has now become a very real threat to human life and healthy communities. The urgency is now limiting global temperature increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius, a goal, as you all know, of the climate, uh, Paris Climate Agreement, requires net zero emissions throughout the world by 2015. So I ask you, what needs to be done today to meet the goals of net zero by 2050? Marilyn, what is a next step that you're looking to achieve in 2021? That's a great question. So we need to mobilize a lot more capital towards climate solutions across the board. Um, and so we in particular have a goal of seeing at least 25 billion more mobilized compared to 2020. We don't have 2020 figures yet, of course. Um, but we want to see, and that's that's a conservative figure. We also want to have um, the adoption of low carbon indices as the default for our asset management industry for public equities. So instead of using a benchmark that's just full of carbon intensive companies, use the low carbon one, use the, the Paris aligned version. Um, that's the version that we need to all be on. We would like to accelerate more climate fintech solutions. Um, we have some great examples here in the United States, um, actually headquartered in, in Los Angeles, uh, Aspiration Bank is an example of that. Um, Lemonade Insurance Company is an example of that. We need to apply our, our technology solutions to the financial um, sector and for climate justice. Um, we would also want to see more quantifiable improvements in diversity and inclusion in the United States and in Europe particularly, uh, where we're focusing on this for climate finance. And finally, but definitely not least, um, the adoption of climate-friendly financial regulations across China, the United States, and Europe. Yeah, yeah Ma Marilyn, yes, those are uh, definitely needed now, today. Uh, uh, and thank you for those, those efforts. Uh, Nancy, what are your goals that are yet to be accomplished? And do you have a timeline in that, in mind? Well, you know, I think uh, I, I I think my goals are really around um, trying to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to to meet the urgent uh, challenge of climate change. So, um, you know, one thing we're doing here at LABWP, you know, we think and um, I think Mary would agree with us that um, you know the the key thing that we can do is to make the electricity grid cleaner and cleaner uh, because that really unlocks um, the potential in other important um, uh, emitting sectors. Um, so, you know, back in the early two, 2000s, uh, LADWP had about 3% of its electricity came from renewable resources, and now we're closer to 40%. If we cut our greenhouse gas emissions um, in half uh, from our 1990 levels and are on the way to cutting them to 80% below 1990 levels by 2030. Um, so, so that's, a, you know, that's an important um, uh, thing that we're doing, um, but it also really means that um, as we invest in uh, you know, charging infrastructure for the transportation mm -hmm. system for both passenger cars and, and uh, heavy duty uh, vehicles like trucks and buses and equipment at the port, um, we, we can both 
reduce the air pollution associated with that and the greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, which account in California for 60% of the greenhouse gas emissions. I hope I got those numbers right. Um, and, and in LA, 80% of the air pollution is coming out of the transportation sector. Um, and the same thing with buildings. As the grid gets cleaner and cleaner, uh, the more that we can use electricity to, to power buildings, uh, that reduces the greenhouse gas emissions. So these are, um, you know, kind of new areas for uh, an electric utility that is, you know, that's traditionally been focused on generating, transmitting, and distributing power uh, across the city of Los Angeles. And so it's really a, a chance for LADWP and other utilities as they get cleaner and cleaner to play an important role in reducing uh, the climate change uh, producing um, pollution from other sectors like like buildings, transportation, and even uh, even industry. Um, so that that's a, a an exciting prospect. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work in progress, um, and something that I think um, you know keeps me excited about coming to work every day. Right. It's it is exciting to reimagine how we're going to live our lives and, and just accept the possibility of letting the innovations and the creativity that exists um, make it happen and uh, just to continue to move forward and pursue it. Uh, similar, Mary, what role do you intend to pursue to protect future generations from the consequences of climate change? Well, uh as long as I can continue to uh, be involved in this work, which I think, as uh, Nancy said earlier, really involves everybody, uh, I'm hoping that I can inspire and encourage uh, everybody to recognize that there are solutions. Uh, I think one of the worst aspects of what we've experienced in the last uh, weeks as a result of the fires and the smoke and the uh, really apocalyptic is not too strong a word look of the skies around us is that it makes people want to uh, go indoors which is probably the healthy thing to do but then to pull the covers up over their head and hope that it will all go away and that is obviously not the solution um, we have to have the will and harness the ingenuity that uh, brought us the industrial civilization that put all the pollutants into the air in the first place and made us dependent on what turned out to be um, a, a, a way of uh, growing our economies which was not sustainable and find the path to sustainability. Uh, our brains can get us out of this situation but it does take uh, concerted effort, especially uh, in societies where people have to vote for the leaders who, uh, who will uh, make the policies and enforce them. One of the most encouraging things, and uh, I'm, uh, I wanna really uh, tip my hat to Marilyn and to uh, the work that she was talking about, uh, is that uh, industry across the world is now stepping up and in many ways leading this effort to uh, get the kinds of changes in underlying laws and policies that are gonna have to be made to get to change fast enough. Uh, the, uh, the movement to acknowledge, recognize, and then figure out solutions and figure out how to finance those solutions is very much now uh, a private sector led endeavor. Uh, we in the public sector who are traditionally uh, a little slower to change have to scramble to catch up with uh, the new knowledge and the new technologies uh, that are coming at us. So um, I wanna keep doing this kind of work, keep trying to make those connections and um, find ways to broaden the circle of uh, groups of people that are involved in, uh, in making the necessary changes happen so that uh, my grandchildren uh, will actually be in a world where 
this is uh, the, the kinds of clean and uh, carbon-free economies that we need are a way of life and not a not a, an object of dispute. Uh, you know, this uh, these last six months have been uh, eye-opening in so many different ways. It's it's almost like we're we're under a, a microscope and things are amplified to a point that you can't ignore them, be it, uh, you know, waking up in the morning and it's, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, but it looks like it's 4 a.m. and the red is, um, and the sky is reddish orange. And, you know, it, it, this can't be happening and the day doesn't change. It just gets darker and darker. So for the panel, we all live in California, but for the, the folks in the rest of the country, that really, really happened where the street lights stayed on all day long. Um, the birds never came out that I could see uh, because it was nighttime all the time and the sun was gone and hidden except by this haze and um, be it the environment, social injustice, um, everything is being amplified and we're all in one place where we can't, we almost are required to pay attention and, and maybe that's a good thing. Um, so 2020 will be the year that we'll all remember for many reasons, including what it's like to live through a global pandemic. My next question for all three panelists, however, is a, to take a more positive approach. What activity is bringing you joy now that you had not done before COVID-19 shelter in place order was issued more than six months ago? Uh, Mary, would you like to start with that question? Well, sure. Um, I'm very fortunate that uh, sometime before COVID struck us, uh, I had um, invited my son and his family to come and share the large house that uh, I was living in when my kids were growing up and when my husband was still alive. And I have faced the choice of moving someplace smaller or uh, figuring out how to recycle my home. And I decided to recycle the house and fill it. And uh, it has been a lifesaver because we're uh, not only living together and all working at home and the six-year-old is going to school uh, from home at this point, uh, but we're able to uh, cook together and to uh, eat uh, dinner together almost every night. And uh, that discovery or rediscovery of the simple pleasures of um, being uh, together and um, helping each other through all of this and just discussing what's going on, I think has helped to keep uh, all of us sane and, and healthy. So that's, that's probably been my main joy as a result of all of this. Mm -hmm. I, 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 that's one of my positive takings is reconnecting with uh, my family, including um, my sisters and brothers and the sons are uh, scattered throughout the country. And um, mm -hmm. I talk to them now more than I ever did okay. before. So it's, I talk to them weekly. That never happened before. <laughs> Marilyn, how cool. about you? What brings you joy? What are you doing that's bringing you joy? So I am, um, you know, before COVID, uh, a lot of my work took me on airplanes to different parts of the world, different parts of the country. And so being sedentary um, has given me more time to actually explore the outdoors, you know, whether it's through a local park, my local lake, my local rose garden, um, or even going to some of the national parks that have reopened since and um, some of those trails uh, that I've never been to. Um, and so that is that is giving me a lot of joy right now. and uh, you know, providing solace at this time. So just rediscovering the, whether it's just 
the, the local rose garden or tree or park uh, to you know being able to go to some of the reserve spaces um, that have nature. Right. Yeah. It's it's um, oftentimes we we travel around the world and we have this marvelous country right here in front of us. Uh, again, the positive is that this is almost forced us to pay attention to the the good that's right uh, in front of us in the gardens and the what's good about uh, the United States. Uh, Nancy, what are you doing? Yeah, so similarly, uh, I haven't been on an airplane since uh, the first week of March, which is which is fine. Uh, but I also, I, I, you know, uh, to get a, to get some exercise, well, the gym's closed. I started walking around my neighborhood and then expanded. I live across the street from uh, one of LA's great parks, Elysian Park, um, and I've started uh, hiking regularly in there, and um, you know, really gotten to appreciate not just uh, the real beauty in LA, but you know, where you stand, except for the last week, if you stand up. Uh, looking towards the mountains and actually uh, when, it, when, it's, when it, we're not experiencing uh, fire related air pollution you can you can see uh, the San Gabriel Mountains um, which you couldn't you know 20 years ago 30 years ago you, you couldn't see so sort of appreciating when it uh, before fire season um, really how much uh, the environment around Los Angeles has improved and that uh, you know, when you when you put your mind to it, you can get it done. Um, so, uh, and I also appreciate how hilly LA is. It's so good for my heart uh, as I tromped up and down the hills. And, and then finally, I think the the part about being in touch. Um, my my siblings and my my very elderly father live thousands of miles away on the East Coast. Um, and so we started every morning checking in with a good morning text. Uh, and an uh, evening FaceTime call, um, and I look forward to both of those every day. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I remember the first month or so of uh, COVID sheltering in place. I just noticed, you know, that there weren't as many cars on the road, and the, the air just seemed so fresh and clean. And it, it, you could think, so this is what it would be like if there were fewer, you know, oil cars on the road. And if we really got to a, a clean environment. And it, it also seemed like there were more birds out. I'm not sure, but it, it just seemed for all the, the difficulties that we might be having, there were, there were so many positive things, I think, that, that um, also came out of are being forced to stop and reckon with what's around us. Uh, so I think we're now at a point where we are open for questions from uh, the audience. Uh, uh, um, Jillian, do you do we have any questions? Yes, thanks, Tavia. So we, we do have a few minutes for Q and A. Um, if you do have questions, please feel free to use the the chat feature, and we'll endeavor to answer them in the time we have remaining. Uh, and we do have two questions submitted already. Um, the first is, what advice do you have for young women in the climate change space? Do we have that for each um, panelist, or is there a panelist who would like to? Marilyn, would you like to? answer that. So um, I guess the advice is for anyone in the in the climate space is to speak out and speak up and speak truth to power and be bold. We know that we have you know roughly a decade left to make a meaningful turnaround um, to avert the worst of climate change impacts. So there's no, uh, I think as Ruth, <laughs> Ruth Ginsburg said, um, you know, do not tarry. Um, we, we definitely have to keep the, uh, the solutions going and accelerate them. So that would be my advice. So maybe I can jump in. Oh, go ahead, you, get, you start, Liz. Thanks, Mary. 
um, just, uh, you know, I, I think one of the exciting things about this, this area about sustainability and, and dealing with climate change is really we need everybody, right? We need, we need lawyers, we need engineers, we need scientists, we need uh, financial, you know, financial people, we need accountants, we need organizers, we need, um, you know, activists, we need everybody. And whatever you are, whatever you are good at or passionate about, you can, you can contribute uh, with whatever that is to, to really making uh, change and, you know, addressing this urgent, um, this urgent climate change issue. So, um, there, there is a place for everyone and everyone's talent in helping, you know, the world really confront this, this uh, massive challenge. I was uh, going to say something similar, maybe in a slightly different way, which is that um, it's, it was noted before, and, and Tavia pointed this out too, that um, the uh, current crisis really puts the focus on sustainability, which uh, only a few years ago was kind of a women's field, and that wasn't necessarily a positive uh, feature of it. It was like, where do you put uh, the highest level woman in the corporate hierarchy? Oh yeah, she's in charge of sustainability. And within the cabinet until uh, only a few administrations ago, women could be head of the EPA, but they couldn't be head of the State Department. They certainly haven't had a woman as head of the Defense Department. So it felt a little bit like it was a, a second class uh, kind of uh, field and this today this morning I read in the paper that for the first time ever um, climate change is now the number one issue on the minds of uh, potential democratic voters uh, in this uh, presidential election that is a goal that I've been working for for a very long time and never made it above you know sixth or tenth issue that was on anybody's mind so uh, the fact that we've got this crisis and people are recognizing it is a crisis about the environment and sustainability also gives room for women to be heard in a field that, uh, you know, is not just uh, a, a women's field, but is actually fundamental to the life of everyone on the planet. And that's perhaps the, the, uh, the good side of what is otherwise a terrible situation. Uh, but it does provide an opportunity for uh, people who might have otherwise been quietly uh, working away to actually be in the center of making the big policy decisions that are going to be made uh, in the next few years. And, and just to, to follow up on that, I know we have another uh, several questions. I, it's so important um uh who the leadership is in the country and that's why for our livelihoods for the environment i think i take comfort in knowing that the younger generations this is a top priority for them and particularly for some of the newest members in congress uh the environment is their number one issue because it does impact directly their community so disproportionately and um, women and people of color and under uh, underserved uh, communities. So um, it's important that the, the policymakers um, keep that in mind. Uh, Jillian, more questions? Yes, we do. So, um, uh, maybe could you touch on what some, uh, what are some great entry level positions or opportunities in the environmental space? I'm just going to start, and if you guys think of, you know, I'm just going to follow up with what Nancy and Mary had said about everything. So, what is it that you're good at. What is your skill set? Are you a lawyer? Are you an engineer? Are you know? Are you in the medical field? Um, are you into research? 
what is it that you are passionate about and how might it affect the environment? And then look for organizations, be they nonprofits, foundations, working with in government agencies that are clearly directed towards the environment. There are many, certainly in California and throughout uh, the country. Um, and look for entry level positions in those organizations. But I wouldn't uh, narrow, put you in a silo. Um, Marilyn, did you want to respond? Yes. So I agree with um, Tavia, Nancy, Mary. Really, this is all hands on deck for, for climate. Um, and so we need people at all levels in all industries to be mobilized for this. And so um, almost virtually any entry level position can be turned into uh, something that's beneficial for our planet and society. Um, even if you are like financial analyst uh, as, a, as an entry level position in many of the analytical roles, that you know you can use that to for ESG and for climate risk and impact. Um, there, if you are an entry level associate in um, a consulting firm, you can help drive uh, positive environmental impact for your clients, um, which also supports the bottom line. Um, look at the supply chain throughout companies, um, not just the four walls. Look at the user. So um, how is how is someone or an entity impacted by a product or service? Look at relationships and stakeholders and how you can include all voices that are impacted also by these decisions, whether you're in the private sector or government. Um, and look at the future. Think about future orientation um, in terms of how will um, my role, this particular job, impact future generations, and that's kind of key to sustainability and what we're trying to achieve by solving climate change. And so use those lenses to whatever the entry level job is, and then you can find your path from there. And maybe just to put a slightly finer point on this, if I may, the uh, Air Resources Board is currently looking to hire a graphic artist. We're, uh, we have a position for a social media uh, person. These are jobs for young people. They actually are entry level jobs. Um, and these are critical to our mission because uh, we're about communications these days in a way that we weren't a few years ago, recognizing that, you know, we need the science, we need the technologies, but if we can't talk to people about them, um, we're not going to succeed in actually getting our solutions implemented. And one thing I'd add is the, um, you know, we, we belong to a bunch of business organizations and, and what we hear and what we as a large employer hear is, um, you know, our employees are really interested in sustainability, um, whether or not it's, you know, officially part of their job, um, you know, their, their job title or, you know, their, their duty. Um, and so, you know, I think in some in part, part, part of what what are driving some of the ESG efforts in the private sector? Are really, it's really coming from these uh, these companies' employees. Um, so, you know, whether or not you you have a environmental component of your job, you know, you can't. There are you know employee organizations. There we have a green team um, that that takes volunteers from all across the organization uh, who get involved in in volunteer activities, but also in helping push. Uh, LADWP to do more. Uh, so look for those opportunities, um, even if you are, you know, uh, uh, working in a job that doesn't have environment as part of the as the title, um, to really um, to make a difference wherever you work. The next question, Jillian. Great. Do we have time for one more? Is everyone comfortable I, with that? I'm just doing a time check. I think so. I think we do. Okay, great. Um, uh, this is for all of the panelists. Who Who is the woman uh, that you look up to most or, or admire most? Who wants to start? Uh, I'll start. My mom. It's, I don't have a big, I don't have a fancy answer for that. It's my mom. <laughs> Here we go. Um, 
I would say there are so many women who I have looked up to. Um, Ruth Bader, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is top of mind right now. And maybe it's because uh, she, she's a lawyer, was a lawyer, was also relatively small build, but uh, was very dynamic. So at the moment she would be, but there were many women uh, whose names you would not know who mentored me along the way. And I stand in their shoes and walk in their path. And they were there to just give me um, the pep talk and just say, you know, there were, there were people who told me, one, you're, you're a girl, you can't go to law school and um, you're, you're not allowed to do certain things. And there were women who said, that's just, you should disregard that and just keep doing what you want to do. You know, I, I, I consider myself uh, very fortunate uh, relatively early in my career to have, have had the chance to work with people like Mary Nichols um, and over now many decades um, of, of, of uh, working together in friendship. And I, I, I consider Mary, you know, the role model, uh, to meet all role models when it comes to uh, uh, environmental, dealing with environmental issues. Um, I guess the other thing I'd say is, as you, as you, as you said, the, you know, Countless women, too many. Who, who, you know, the world doesn't necessarily know, but those people that we spend every day with, um, you know, at, to the extent that we can, we support each other and can reinforce uh, and admire and um, highlight um, the good qualities of all the women that we work with. I think we together uh, can uh, can make uh, women's voices uh, even louder. I'd like to uh, uh, express my somewhat contrarian view about who to look up to, because as a 75-year-old, um, I look out and the people that I see that I most admire and uh, sometimes even envy, but always learn from, are actually the much younger women activists who may not have been appointed to big jobs or have fancy titles, although in some cases, like the uh, Greta Thunberg, they've gotten on the front uh, covers of magazines. But uh, my own daughter, who is an adult and uh, a practicing lawyer and an expert in her own field, um, but as a, as a young working mom, and a person uh, very engaged in the world around her is always um, surprising me and correcting me uh, in some of my assumptions about what's okay and what's not okay to put up with. So uh, I think that it's important to all of us, especially as we uh, try to address the global problem that, we're, that brought us together here today, uh, to recognize that we can learn a lot from our own kids. Thank you, Mary. I think that uh, is a good end, giving you the last word um, uh, for this reckoning, the force to reckon with. And um, along those lines, it, we're all in it together. Uh, it takes a collaboration. Uh, knowing uh, that it involves everyone in the community. And the last thing that I would leave everyone with is please vote early. <laughs> and with that, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to, to everyone for attending. I think he'll sign us off.